Alrighty, so up next we have Mystical Ninja starring Goemon with Zar. Alright, here we go. Two, one, go. Alright, well, since he just jumped right into it, this is Mystical Ninja starring Goemon for yes. Nintendo 64. This is Zar, um, and this is uh, the start of the game, so. Yeah, the game starts immediately off with you heading to the first castle. Normally, in regular gameplay, you'd be heading towards Mount Fuji, but that's not the case because we can skip the item that we would normally get, which is the chain pipe, by using some exploits, which, by the way, only work. One of them only works in Japanese version, so skipping the chain pipe is Japanese only. And right here, uh, I'm going to be jumping into the sign. The collision for that fence and sign kind of mesh together, so jumping on top of it on that fence will like have them collide and I'll go inside, or in some cases I can boost just straight up, and then from there I can access the area ceiling and just make my way to where I need to go, because the doorways still work up on the top there. And that area he just bypassed is actually where you would use the chain pipe. It's the first time that you would use that. You skip using that item twice in this 80% run. Yes. Um, you also see him hugging walls a lot. Uh, he's going to be doing that because it increases your forward momentum. And it looks really funky. Uh, you actually move faster when wall hugging like that um, while running backwards. It's really weird. You'll probably see a lot of it. But he's definitely going to be kissing a lot of walls. Yeah, that. It's ever so slightly, but it really makes up in time over how rapidly I have to use it. It's like super metric, just like shoulder pumping. In yeah. A sense. It's going to add up over time. Mm -hmm. And everybody loves to grind, right? So yep. this is where we get uh, 1,100 Rio, enough for purchasing two items, or one item, and something that you use 300 for later. Yeah, to talk with this witch that'll contact the dead, but it's, the guy's actually not dead, but they're just two big event triggers. A lot of the Goemon games seem to enjoy having these like big money spots where you have to throw out a whole bunch of money to get by. Um, Luckily, we have this room in the very beginning of the game. So. Yeah, it's like they specifically designed this room for those two cases. And with getting Rio, you just want to like get a rhythm going with the jump and attacks. Um, try not to spill Rio or miss jars, but even if I miss a couple, that's okay. So each Rio is worth five. There's six pots, so you should technically get 120 for a perfect run through this room. And I mean, it's it's funny because this room is actually pretty technical in a in a way. It's very difficult. Yeah. Just to do smooth. Even if I don't get the exact 1120 that I would get like in a perfect cycle, uh, leaving with anything like around 1040 or 1050, that's okay. But it looks like I'll probably end around uh, 1100 here. Be fine. There are other places to gain Rio throughout. Since yeah. Cesar knows this game pretty much in and out, he knows the places to get it to not have to worry about backtracking or anything like that. Yeah, and so I'm going to be doing Rio hovers here. You can actually use money as a weapon in this game, and when you jump and throw it in the air, it'll actually keep the character's height up longer. And so with Goemon, you can cross those gaps. Normally, you'd be using the chain pipe to cross those there, but Ryo takes care of that. And so, so, so uh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> okay, so this is like the first of three melee rooms. Um, the nice thing about this game is that everything will always start off exactly the same when you first walk in, and it's just up to you to find the most optimal movement to like make it consistent throughout. So that'll be coming in handy in a couple of later rooms. And the big thing is also with the Rio hovering and using it against enemies, he is wasting one Rio each throw, so he has to account for that too. Yeah. But because there's there's like extra pickups. It's really so much in the run, you don't really kill. have to worry that much if you got a good Rio farm. And now in this room, it's actually kill five instead of killing all the enemies. And there is a chance I can skip this key cutscene if I kill the last two enemies at the same time. I did not get it right there, but it's fine. You'll also notice that I'm jumping at the start of every single room. That's an acceleration jump. 
Normally, when you enter rooms, you'll have like a little bit of a startup, and then it kicks into the full-on running. The jumping at the start will skip over that, so you immediately can get into running animation. And also, it helps with when you want to go in a specific direction that's not forward, because normally uh, it always will just start you off like going forward in the room, and that's not always what you want. And I also play around with the camera a lot during the wall hugs, or they're called edge runs actually. And it's just to... My bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just to increase your speed a little bit and make like getting angles like this a bit easier, not as awkward on the controller stick. So here's a... a a big sequence brand coming up uh, requiring the, the chain pipe. It's another big part. Um, you see him jumping over these gaps with Rio and using the sign zip in the beginning to bypass those. But this is a big one we call it chain pipe skip. Um, and we'll see if he gets the quick cycle here. Yeah, this also only works in the Japanese version because jumping inside of corners in the Japanese version. Okay, I did not get the quick version. Hold on. Um, it actually increases like the the height of the character faster for whatever reason they programmed it like that and then changed it in the US release so by using that in that corner and then also the damage boost to sustain my height longer I can use that to boost up on top of that platform and that I mean that little skip right there the deep boost it's pretty precise timing also so yeah and once again, if you get hit by the ball, you have to go back. There's a health here for people like me <laughs> to go back and do that room a couple times. But and you can't Rio hover across those gaps because um, Rio hover where you pop up on top of the platforms. The popping up stuff only happens if you can actually grab onto that platform normally, and those ones you actually can't. So that's why we have to do damage boosts in that room to see or not see a cool skip here. <laughs> All right. So again, that's Japanese only. Um, when you're on side, when you're on top of like objects that would block you in certain positions, you can go into first person mode and then come out of it, and it'll free up your position, so you can start moving. And now I'm moving towards the boss door, but <laughs> I did not get it. I'm, I grabbed the dumpling. I heard nothing, and you didn't see it technically, right? So. Yeah. This is the first boss, Congo. Uh, he's pretty interesting. There's some stuff going on with him. You want to do the initial hit like that and then have him drag over here because he does... This is like his set position that he will start his attack cycle for this in. So you don't want him wasting time moving. And you just chip away at his health. Not every hit that I do actually does something. It's only when like little flakes of his chin come off. Um, the goal is to attack him and get a cycle of damage in during this uh, electric field. And I missed the first one, but I got the second. It's pretty tricky going around trying not to get hit by the laser and kind of swing because you have to jump and angle in a weird direction and then change it the whole entire time while going around. The back yeah. side of I was definitely really annoying. Oh yeah, that's that's my hardest section like to actually hit him in. It's the best that you don't do damage the whole entire time, but you get the sound effect for it. Yeah. Makes it sound like he has this crazy amount of health. <laughs> so he's gonna drop the first of four items that I have to collect throughout the run. They're called miracle items, and eventually we're gonna use these to reach space where the villains are at of the game. But now we're gonna go talk to the Lord of Oedo, and he's gonna explain kind of what happened to his castle. You skip the opening cutscene at the start of the run by just pressing start. It's really nice because you just jump right into the gameplay that way. But some exposition is that he uh, 
Goemon and Ibisumaru are like in this restaurant, and Ibisumaru strips, and they're getting chased out, and then all of a sudden they see this spaceship flying overhead that shoots this laser beam at Oedo Castle, and it transforms it into this like really flamboyant looking design. And so Goemon and Ibisumaru go and investigate, and the Lord of Oedo kind of has an idea of who it is, and he's giving us a pass now to exit Oedo Town so we can head to other different provinces and stuff of Japan. Pretty much solve what's going on. You put the pieces of the puzzle back together. You. And also coming up is another Japanese exclusive glitch called Map Glitch. Um, it's done by simply just holding C right on the map during the loading zone. You. Like the black screen time. You. You. And it unloads all the objects inside of the area as long as I continue holding it. Once I let go, those will all like pop back up. Uh, I can't use it in every single room because for some reason map glitch will delete different entrance points and exit points of certain areas. It's mo it mainly seems like it's um uh like door animations, ones that have just a hole in the wall, like a loading zone for a hole. Those work fine. But usually the big doors inside of towns and castles will freeze the game. But again, that's not always the case. Because in this next room, I'll be holding map glitch again, and there'll be like an opening door just like this, and I'll be able to go through just fine. It's really odd how it works, and no one is certain as to why uh, loading zones get deleted. See, I'm just holding it here again, and I let go, and no freeze. Yeah, so you're actually going to be not seeing a lot of this game because he will be mad with you in a good amount. <laughs> yeah, it'll just look like a lot of stuff is just empty fields. Which, I mean, some of it is, but not all <laughs> of it. <laughs> like this empty field you're about to go through? Yes. This just makes it a little bit more empty. Mm -hmm. And kind of boss-free. Yeah, because this is where the first impact boss normally would be. There are two more, so you will get to hear the song that everyone knows and loves. Twice. Yes, twice. But just not here, not yet. Is it alright if I read a quick donation? Sure. Okay. We have a donation from Koji Likes Beer. Yo, Zar, gotta drop some real for one of my favorite games growing up as a kid. Good luck on the run, dude. Thanks, Koji. So, right there, I was trying to go for a slope jump. Um, in some cases, you can actually jump on s slopes if you time it correctly, like the frame that you land. It sounds like it would be really useful, and it is in some spots, but we have like new glitches now that make slope jumping kind of obsolete. And that's that area, that small area right there is the main remnant of where slope jumping would be useful. And getting it only saves about 8 seconds. But it's so satisfying. Yeah, it is. It feels tight. <laughs> really good. So yeah, now I can let go of map glitch, because the, the impact trigger was back that way a little bit. But here it's gone, so I can just let go of it and it's fine. Usually that building's there. Yeah. But since it technically, does it does it just skip the impact or does it register you have beating? It just skips it. it I don't, skips it, it doesn't register anything. So that if you walk past that building and then let go of map glitch, it still doesn't spawn? Um. Yeah, like if I go back that way, eventually I'll hit the trigger and have to do the impact fight. Okay. So we're being introduced here to the character Yai. Uh, she's kind of like a detective in the series. Um, definitely the most straightforward character compared to the other two, like Goemon and Abisumaru, who you'll be seeing in the run, and Sasuke, who we skip. They're kind of a little bit more quirky, but she's played a little bit more serious. And she's telling us here that um, she's investigating who the villains are that attacked Widow Castle and has found them out to be the Peach Mountain Shoguns. And so since our goals are the same, she wants to team up with us. And she'll be coming into play pretty heavily later on in the speedrun. I can actually switch to another character, Bisumaru, but it hasn't been necessary yet. He'll come into play, though. You'll see plenty of Abisu as well. They all have... 
They're cool little techniques. They really all play their roles in the game. The game is really well designed when it comes to that aspect. Mm -hmm. Especially in the speed run too. Like, and even casually, like you use all the characters to their full abilities. It's really nice. All right, so coming up is the most notorious glitch in the game is Ben K skip. I thought we were fishing. We're not fishing. We're Ben K skipping. So you clip inside this ladder, and during the zip up, I can attack and nice. zip across the screen to reach the other side, and it's kind of like an out-of-bounds area. And then from there, if I jump, I'll get boosted up onto the area ceiling, and I can walk past the trigger. There's a guy called Ben K blocking the bridge, and there's a side quest you have to do where you fish and get rewarded with a log that you throw at him to defeat him, and he'll let you pass. Like He'll be honored that you can take him on and he actually gives you Sasuke's like lifeless body as well and that stuff takes about six or seven minutes and you just saw him skip it yeah definitely under 30 seconds so yeah <laughs> it's a big time save huge and it's one of the most annoying things to learn ever in this game yeah anyone that's ever speed run this game even just a little bit has spent a good amount of time on Venke skip for sure I've streamed that ladder for many hours yes <laughs> So this uh, room, he's map glitching here, and I think he should let go of map glitch at the bridge just to see why we also map glitch, because it's just a little laggy, just a little bit. The game lags pretty bad. Uh, map glitch also helps get rid of all of those sprites and everything, so just move a lot. It's we move a lot more smoothly throughout certain situations like that. Mhm. Mm like that room is probably the worst case of just lag, like back aways when there's the enemies on screen. The game feels like it's running at probably 5 FPS or something. It's just so slow. And so from there, we're being transported onto a dragon. I guess ancient Japan uses dragons as their transport. But there's something weird going on with this dragon and that it's being uh, controlled by this machine. So we're heading over to go fight it. There's some enemy spawns that come up uh, while making my way. The only ones that I really have to worry about are those dragon heads because they come like charging down onto the screen. The bulb headed guys, usually if they're not in a pack, they're fine. But I always want to take care of the dragon heads because taking damage on this dragon is bad. Uh, it's really funky. So they did something really weird with like, they had a tough time programming it because if you get hit, you're, you kind of fly all over the dragon. You have a good chance of just getting thrown off. Yeah, you warp around very oddly during your um it's really aggressive yeah during your what is that called iframes yeah it's called iframes invincibility frames <laughs> so yeah i'm fighting this machine i actually could have skipped that cutscene of dialogue right there if i had pressed pause right as it appears there's different uh dialogue skips that you can do during cutscenes how much of the cutscene you skip though depends on whether or not like a new actor or a camera angle occurs in the cutscene. This one is one of the big ones because nothing really special goes on. It's just a text box, so it would take me right to the end. But that's not always gonna happen if I get other text skips. Some of them will just take me a little bit further along into the cutscene than normal. And this boss fight is very simple. Just stay back. Uh, this is like the safe spot area where all the bullets will fly overhead. Like we mentioned earlier, you do not want to get hit because falling off this dragon, you start all the way back at the beginning. So I have to run all the way back up and watch the cutscene again of him talking and just do all my hits over. And it's six hits? Yeah, I think it's around there. I never keep track. It, the fight feels really short if you get uh, the dialogue skip, but if you don't, it feels like it's super long. Now we're getting dropped into another cutscene. Um, turns out the dragon is actually this little boy named Koryuta. And we're going to learn from him that the Peach Mountain Shoguns kidnapped him to use his dragon abilities to kidnap different children to join their dance troupe. The villains in this game are like 
this these opera stars that just want to be loved by Japan. So their main goal is just to have everyone be in love with them, attending their shows just constantly. This is real. <laughs> this is a real story. Yes. It's actually really, really hilarious. The Going On series, all of them are super quirky like this. Mm hmm They really go for bizarre stuff. And I'm also going to get a flute item from Korita, and that's going to be given to Yai, the green-haired girl that you saw earlier. Uh, it allows us to warp to any like town, castle, or coffee shop that we've been into previously. So if those warp points, uh, it really cuts down on time where I'd have to be walking through a field or something. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to come in great handy right away because I'm going to grab the warp point of this town before I head up the stairs to go grab Fire Rio. Just so I can warp back down without having to travel down the stairs. Again, map glitching because there's different enemy spawns on this and they get in the way of just getting the perfect line. A lot of this right now in the speedrun is just setting up for later events. And then after about 10 minutes or so, things really kick into gear where we're just going through the different castles and whatnot. But Fire Rio is needed to access the second castle, otherwise we won't be able to get inside. That's what we're getting right now. Yeah. Just making this climb a little bit more. This is the end right here. Yep. And so I throw three Ryo with map glitch activated because it does lag a little bit at the start there and then let go. You can only have three Ryo on screen at a time, so I have to wait until they actually touch that a little bin because I'm donating money to the gods and I get blessed with the ability to shoot fire Ryo now that I've given them five. Now I'm just switching to Yai and playing the flute. What's nice about warping in this game is that usually all your warps are just a flick back on the controller stick of where you need to go in the speed run at least, or just holding A down, or going to Zazen, which is two flicks right. You want to keep that in mind because warping to the long, wrong location obviously is a big detriment in time. Each warp's what, 30 seconds or something like that? Yeah. And so yeah, I just exited the town. It takes me to the exit, so you get to see nothing of that town, which is unfortunate because it's actually a pretty cool place, but don't get to see none of it. In the next room, I'm actually going to be doing something called Time Stop. Uh, it's done by simply playing the flute, and then when I'm by a ladder, I can interrupt that flute playing animation and just grab onto it, onto the ladder. Uh, normally when you're playing the flute, uh, time stops. So by interrupting it like this, I can just carry on through this area. Normally certain parts of this bridge are supposed to fall apart, and that actually causes a good deal of lag. So this is just some nice lag reduction. You could time stop on signs too, can't you? Yeah, you can do it by reading a sign, and like during the turn towards the sign, you press pause. That's a little bit slower than playing the flute though. Don't really time stop much in the run. Yeah, it sounds like it would be really useful, but it's not. It's just unfortunate. Uh, I'm just going to this coffee shop. Over to the right in this area is where the next castle is, but if I go over there, uh, you'll find that there's like a small cubby hole fit for a dwarf. And so we're trying to figure out how we can get inside. And talking to that old man, whoops, I didn't mean to switch there. Um, talking to that old man, he tells us that he knows someone in Zazen. So we're gonna head back there. Try to figure out how to get through that hole. Yeah, Zazen is like one of the big hub towns of the game. A lot of different events occur through here. So we head back to Zazen a lot throughout the run. Yeah, you revisit it like three or four times throughout the whole run. So 
I'm gonna say it. I think Zara is just a little nervous because I haven't been hearing him switch items to the music. <laughs> so he's either nervous or just concentrating really hard, which is both okay. But usually that's the big thing is when we have these open fields that we go through, we kind of like to switch the items to the music because it was just seems like it was designed for it. Yeah, it really does. So the person I'm talking to here is actually normally the person that we do the fishing side quest with, but we skipped past it, and now we find out that they're a dwarf. With that adorable walking sounds, yes. <laughs> little squeaks. You'll be hearing the walking sound a little, like a whole bunch with Abyssumaro here, because he gets the ability to shrink. You're gonna hear a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Throughout the rest of the run. So yeah, we're just following the dwarf over to this uh, specific area. Um, in order to get our shrinking ability, we have to go inside this guy's cabinet. And he looks like Mr. Saturn, which is, I think they did that on purpose. Yeah, it definitely seems like it. And we have to collect eight sweets that are inside his cupboard without him catching us and murdering us to death with his rain of bullets that'll come down if he spots us. They look like batteries that explode. Yeah. Right there, I got bad luck by getting hit immediately. For some reason, they programmed this a little bit funky. It's fun. That happens to me yeah. every time I play this game. Um, it's You want to be really careful not to die here, just because you'd have to do it all over. And oh, We all have, though. Yeah, it definitely happens. And the, the the sweets the sweet drops are random, right? Where they drop is random. The time that they drop though is within seven seconds of that timer. Okay. So it'll always the last sweet will always drop at the forty two second mark. And if you don't get them they do despawn. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, only one can be on screen at a time. As soon as the next one drops to the ground, uh, the other one will disappear if you didn't get it. So now we have mini uh, Bisumaru. You'll be seeing a lot of him as Can't he wait. allows for the biggest sequence break in the game, and those are called Abisu Slides. I'm going to be doing the first one right off here to grab that 800 Rio Cucumber that was mentioned earlier at the start. Um, the thing with the Bisu Slides is that they can be very tricky. It seems like they're designed to be, um, hold on, let me just do it first. So you shrink down, jump, and then flick the controller stick as you land, and you get into this, like, sliding animation, and that can take you through walls, but not every single time. For some reason, you'll get blocked even if you got a perfect full-on slide. So we theorize that it may be the camera angle or where Abisu is before he starts to slide towards the wall. It could be any of those things, but we're not quite sure. Some slides definitely work easier than other ones, but the ones that are coming up, because we're heading to Ghost Toys, the second castle, there's five that we have to do right off the right at the start. Those are definitely the worst ones in the run. I think anyone that runs the game would agree that the five that you do here are definitely the hardest. I skipped two of them. Yeah, you so. can, some people skip the last two because they're just, it's not worth it. If you're not good at slides or well, can't get them What are you trying to say, Zara, huh? <laughs> you gotta step up your game, Josh. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Sub 120 never, sure. So slides like that aren't needed, but it is nice because sliding, if you get a good slide, you do go faster than walking. So it's just a, you know, if you're on your game, you get those little extra slides in, it all adds up. Yeah. But then again, it doesn't if you fail. So, <laughs> so that's just how slides work in the game. So you're going to see Fire Rio right here. This is why he had to get it. Um, pretty much this is the only reason that you have to get it, right? Yeah, I believe so. If you could get past those torches, you would not need to collect it. He uses it later, but yeah, not technically needed. 
It is uh, actually a powerful weapon. It does three damage instead of one, like the other weapons do. So I'll be using it to take out different enemies that have uh, higher amounts of health. So the first slide went really well. Usually that's going to be always the case. These ones though... Okay. Nice. <laughs> nice. Okay. Never mind. The slides are easy here. What am I talking about? Hopefully this grabs. Yeah, it did. We got the double celebration though. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What's going on here? I, so those are like, just, you get stuck there for days. I have no idea. It's pretty difficult. He's waiting here because he technically hasn't collected the camera yet. Mm -hmm. I have to go through this text box first. Otherwise it will not appear in my inventory. All right. Now I have it. Well, let's see what these slides do. Are you going to this side? Yep. Alright, there's a block. You've now seen a block. Just one, though. That still went yeah, that, very well. That is uh, very... I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to clap for you. <laughs> Th that one's actually really difficult because you can't see the wall. So you don't know where your placement is. If you're too close to the wall, you can't get big. It gives you a honking noise. <laughs> so you really have to know exactly where your placement is in that room. And then even if you get a good slide, that invisible wall that you have to clip through is just horrible. So it's really a big block. Yeah, definitely. I just skipped past a kill all room. That one I can skip past because, like I mentioned earlier, it's one of those cases where the door is just a hole in the wall. So just getting right next to it with Mini Ibisu will just take me through to the next room. Coming up, I'm going to be doing a death warp to save a little bit a little bit of time. Uh, optimally, I kind of want my health to be around two or three hearts. That's why I was taking damage during the Congo fight. The first boss with the electric fields is just to lower my health down. But it seems like I grabbed some dumpling drops along the way. Which is okay. It's no big deal. Take a hit here, actually. So yeah, I'm going to map glitch through here. Uh, normally, I wouldn't want to do that unless I was death warping. Yeah, so if you map glitch in a room and unrelease it in a room that usually would soft lock you, uh, it's not the end of the world. You could either die in that room if you have uh, extra life, and it will revert that room back to normal, so then you could leave and not soft lock, or void out as uh, me, if you mm -hmm. But it's just so much easier to die. <laughs> These are impossible to jump over. Oh, <laughs> that would have been it, wouldn't it? Yeah, th <laughs> there was a chance I actually wouldn't have gotten hit, but generally you'll get hit by that little spinning spike. They basically program it where you'd have to inch along with the spinning animation to get by. So in this room, I kind of would have wanted to get a health refill to do a later death warp. There are two different death warps that I can go for coming up, but I think we're gonna go for the earlier one. They really don't make up for much time in difference. Like, if I did the later one, it would have only been about five seconds faster, I think. And here I'm gonna be doing a mini Ibisu water slide. They're way easier to do than regular Ibisu slides. The trick to them is that you just shrink down in water and then you just have to flick the controller stick forward, like one swimming animation forward, jump in the air, and then during the resurfacing bit of the animation, uh, hit C up again to untransform, and you'll get like a water slide that'll take you through walls. They generally seem to be more well behaved and actually clip you through pretty consistently, but I have been blocked hard by them, like especially that last one that I did in particular where I just died early on and it really screwed up the rest of the run. And they're just, they're easier to pull off, like mm -hmm. you said. Yeah, it's just, there's not so, it's loose timing on the water slides. Yeah, and right there I could map glitch that room because for whatever reason, some of the doors in Ghost Toys, they actually have like a program loading zone behind them. So as long as I don't slide the door open, 
uh, I can get through just fine. They're like actually two different loading zones almost. So Zara is not, not only a really good Mystical Ninja player, he's also a really good at billiards. <laughs> we'll see. Will, the, will these get Beardini's approval? Never. I would say yes. That was that, that was, was really spectacular. Like, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really fun room, and it's nice because you can figure out like a really nice uh, optimal setup to get through it because. All the rooms start off exactly the same every single time you enter them. There's never going to be any sort of different billiards pattern there. So it's all about just finding the easiest and fastest one for you. That was really clean. And it's just, if you lose track of one of the billiards, it's oh, become yeah. such a mess. I've died on that table. I mean, I've spent two minutes on that table. Wasted Rio, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's it's really easy to die. If you're doing the alternate death warp, that's like five seconds faster. You want to go in there with the half heart. And even if you hit like the last billiard ball, the eight ball, it could still like go in a direction that'll just go into Goemon and kill him. It's great. <laughs> yeah, super awesome. So here we have the second boss. Yeah, this is Dario Manio. Um his deal is that we take a picture of him with the camera, and that makes him transparent. He's supposed to be like a ghost robot. And so we're trying to do damage during that time where it's transparent, so it exposes his heart. There's two cases where I can get in three hits during these cycles. The first one is quite easy. I can just throw a Rio shot here when he's jumping across the room to get it. The next one is a little bit more specific where I have to hit the slashes early on. There is a tech where you can go behind him and have his transparency last a little bit longer, but I'm not exactly familiar with it. Claude came up with it and I've yet to try it out. But I was gonna ask, is that a Claude thing? Yeah, definitely worth doing though. I'm, I need to learn it though. Also these missiles, sometimes they can be duds and Generally, that's okay. Uh, you want to avoid getting the first one as a dud, though. It just happens randomly. You really don't have control over it. But the reason why you don't want to get the first one as a dud is because his heart will still be flickering, so you can't do the damage that you need to. Because if you get a dud, he automatically just reverts into that transparency mode. And I just collected the second miracle item in the game. And we're going to be treated with a hologram image of one of the villains dancing. You get your laugh there, you know, because that's very important in those games. Yeah, you know he's evil if he has a laugh like that. So he's talking to Goemon about his great ambitions for Japan to become a beautiful stage. His name is Fresh Spring Breeze Dancing. That's the full name for him. Um, and he ends up calling Goemon Fernandez and Ibisumaro Antonio for whatever reason. I guess it's just to establish that he's that big of a star that he can call people whatever he wants. Because these villains, before they decided to like go about their uh, plan, they are actually just well known in Japan to begin with. They just wanted to be more famous, I guess. And now I'm warping back to Oedo Town. I'm actually heading to the fourth castle in the game. I can't skip any of the castles though. The game does check for all four miracle items. Uh, we're just going to the fourth one here because it just works out to be the most optimal. Uh, it definitely skips past some of the side quests that we would normally have to do after the third one. And the big one is um, getting Goemon's technique for him to go Super Saiyan. It's kind of a useless technique, though, in the grand scheme of the game, because it's only used to push these metal boxes. And I guess it makes Goemon, like, a little bit stronger. Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, I did not mean to let go of it right there. So now I have to BC slide through this wall. This could take a little bit. Yeah, this is a good introduction to a BC slides. Yeah, getting blocked. There we go. That wasn't too bad. 
A little silly on my part, though, to let go. Yeah. Hey, at least you haven't, like, map glitched the wrong room yet. Yeah, exactly. So it now we're working our way to actually, like he said, the fourth dungeon. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to go through another town there, and we're going to have to, you know, gather some other uh, power-ups. I guess you could call it that. Yeah. The mermaid technique being the big one. Uh, we're going to be using that 300 Rio to talk to this witch. And she's going to uh, contact the dead. So we can talk to our dead friend, the wise old man. All right, nice. There is a setup kind of for that slide where I like hug against that wall. And it creates a nice diagonal looking camera angle. Usually I feel like when I have that camera angle, I'll clip through first try. Because that wall is also kind of notorious for being... A major block problem. Yeah. Yeah, now we're just strolling through Festival Village. This is a really cool town. I like its aesthetic a lot and the music. Uh, we don't get to see much of it though, just because we're gonna run right through it. So here's another glitch that you haven't seen yet coming up. Right? Well, you kind of technically saw it with the Benkei skip. Oh, that's right. You're yeah. way better than I am. I don't <laughs> do this. Okay, you don't see... You'll see the glitch I'm talking about later. <laughs> well, you might see if I don't get the Makori. No, you're going to get it. We'll see. So, yeah, I can Makori through stuff. Hold on. That's it right there. Nice. So, basically, I map glitch, and when the objects are despawned like that, if I go inside of them and let go, there's, like, this point during that period where it's pushing Goemon or whatever character I'm playing as up through the object. And if I attack on the right frame, it'll give me that crazy zip speed that I got with Benkei Skip. And I can use that to travel through great distances or in this case, like across the mountains. Normally you're supposed to be upgrading your weapons to get past that like big pillar block, which I could normally just get past with map glitch, but the, the Macquarie up there definitely cuts down on some travel time. And so yeah, she's contacting the wise old man. Um, he's basically just gonna tell us that we're doing good. We gotta collect some more miracle items. There's just one more left, and then we can go fight the guys in space. These cutscenes are definitely out of sequence, so it's kind of nice that they're in Japanese. Because <laughs> if you were reading this, you'd be like really confused on what's happening. Uh, his house is actually the one that's supposed to be blown up during the first impact cutscene. But later on, when we get to the final castle, we actually figure out that he's not dead and that they just kidnapped him and they made him create all the different robot enemies that we fight on our adventure through Japan. All right, so that's the return Macquarie. Nice. That one's really nice. Uh, you just hold right, courtesy to Claude, by the way, who came up with that one. Just hold right and get lined up in that doorway frame, let go and Mash B at the right time. Um, that one, you don't have to hold any direction because it's a sloped angle. Like, the roof will automatically push you towards that direction. So it's a nice one where you don't have to worry about, like, is my angle going to be right or is it going to take me out of bounds? That skips warping back to Festival Village. And you think that'd be a huge, huge time save, but it's actually not. Um, like I said, warping, or Josh said, warping with the dragon is takes about 30 seconds of time. That walk through is like 25 seconds, so it only saves about five to get that Macquarie Slash. But I definitely love going for it because I just think it looks awesome. All I think all the Macquaries in this game are just great. Yeah. They're just so funky. So this is the Mermaid minigame. Let's be backwards. Oh my god, <laughs> yes! she's backwards! <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, either just, we're gonna see something really amazing here, or... Yeah, the game could freeze here. But it doesn't it look like it's like going to happen. Good. It, could, it could freeze right here. We'll see. No, nope, we're good. I mean, it's Mystical Ninja could freeze wherever, technically. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's, so, yeah, I'm going to let him explain that one. That's really funky. So, recently we found out that she can be facing the wrong way during the Mermaid minigame. We think it's caused from the Macquarie Slashes, like, screwing around with their... Uh, like position where she gets set 
because it would never happen when we used to just warp to Festival Village. But now that we're doing Macquarie's back there, it seems to happen like over, I would say like 25% of the time, or maybe even more than that, because I've seen it quite a bit. That's like my fifth time seeing that. And there's also a chance that during that mini game, uh, the game can just randomly crash for whatever reason. No matter what way she's facing. Yeah, no matter just what. Just the game in general, like that mini game. But the funny thing is that with that weird, her facing like towards the camera, the first time I got it, the game did freeze. And it was like the second freeze I got in the day of, cause I did like three runs that day. The first run got to Mermaid and it froze. And then I did like another one, got to the Mermaid, had that weird facing the wrong way thing and it froze. So I thought, oh great. This like ups the chances of it freezing because generally like it's probably a, a 10% chance that like, you'll get the soft lock there. And then Claude, what got it the next day? No, Claude got it like a few hours later. Claude he just like goes and boots up the game to do a run, does that Macquarie, and then what do you know? He gets the fuck, uh, gets <laughs> yeah. the the face the wrong way and freezes. Yeah. Oh no, he didn't freeze. He didn't freeze. Oh yeah, no. that's right. He that's made right. it. He, he made, made it. it. His sound effects. I remember that clip. <laughs> <laughs> so confused. What? So yeah, we're just swimming to the submarine now. It's located in Japan Sea. Uh, we'd actually be able to skip this technique if we could figure out how to get through this section without Mermaid. Uh, we can't map glitch it though, because oddly enough, and this is like the only case of it, with the, these doors at least, this whole, whole loading zone, I guess you'd call it, uh, gets deleted with map glitch. So we can't actually uh, reach it unless we swim with Mermaid. I just want to let everybody know, if you're hungry and you like sushi, get prepared. Because <laughs> that's what this level is. Yeah, this is Gourmet Submarine. It's the food-themed dungeon. Which is just, every game needs that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to need a little water slide here. Skips uh, going through a whole elevator and floor, right? Yeah, it skips a big chunk of the submarine. There's only a couple rooms left after this. I'm going to spawn some platforms here with the camera. That's normally how you get through this room, but I'm just going to cut through a little bit. Oh, I screwed up. So I was supposed to Rio hover up on top of that platform, and now we get to suffer with some major lag. Yeah, that, I mean, this is another good room that just shows how laggy the game can be. Yeah, you can just do a water slide, though. These are the two enemies where Fire Rio comes in handy. Normally, they take three hits, but with Fire Rio, they die instantly because that does three damage. Uh, hitting them with like regular weapons takes a while because they get up, attack you, get up, and then attack you, and then they die. So these are the chopsticks. Um, definitely the most noteworthy section of the dungeon. Like, one's the part of the dungeon that probably saves the most time if you do quickly. They're very difficult in that there's such a narrow pathway you can easily fall off and waste a bunch of time having to get back on them or go a different way. You have to go back to the other side of the room, climb the ladder, and then take the cross again. Yeah. Uh, it's for, for people interested in this game, just want to know about that room. Zara has a really awesome tutorial about it. Uh, DCX, I recommend if you're watching, you should check it out. <laughs> yeah, I need that for that 100% going monathon run. Yeah, he definitely does. I made it look really easy there, but I I feel like I've gotten so good at it from making that tutorial. It's ridiculous. That room is just ridiculous yeah, to do it quickly. A lot of it is just like making sure you have accurate movement, and moving proper, the camera around. Yeah. Proper angles. Mm -hmm. So this is another cutscene. Um, this guy, we're thinking that he has a miracle item, and it turns out that he actually doesn't. He dropped it in Zazen. Oh, I think I might have got dialogue skip here. Okay, there's there's a case of dialogue skip. Nice. So normally she'd be talking, that's Kitty Lily, the other villain of the game, who's working with Danson. It just skipped to the next point where Danson spawns. And there's another one coming up, and I paused too early. But I could skip like this whole dialogue here if I got that with the correct timing. It's one frame. But yeah, they're just they're arguing with each other because they're kind of mad that he lost the miracle item piece. And so they're trying to take care of us by blowing up the submarine. And this is where Impact comes into play in his song. 
the first one. Yeah, this is the first. Well, the second one in the game, but the first one, the run, technically. Yeah, the first one, the run. It just never gets old. Dude. Definitely not. No. <laughs> I love it. So that's the intro song to Impact. Uh, Impact is actually kind of similar to the villains in that he's like this big, great star in the world of Goemon. You find out at the end of these boss fights that he's like filming movies in America and France. The song is basically just him singing about how great, beautiful, and gorgeous he is. <laughs> um, it's sung by, I can't remember the guy's name, but the person that sings that song actually did a lot of different robot anime themes. I think some for a different Gundam series, but I might be wrong. I know he did stuff for a lot of robot anime though. Uh, usually it's like tradition for people to sing the song. I'm a person that breaks that tradition though and that <laughs> I just can't sing. There is one streamer though, Danzel Glovington, who sings every time and he does a good job of it because for one, he lives in Japan, speaks Japanese, but he was actually also Which an cool opera singer. Opera, yeah. yeah, so he has a great voice for that song. And I didn't really talk about that runway stage because there's not much to it. Uh, hold forward. Yeah, that's that's. that's it actually strap. it actually speeds up that whole section mm -hmm. by like a couple minutes. <laughs> I don't have to worry about any of the buildings. Uh, when I'm blowing stuff up, it's getting added to my Rio count for the boss fight and also my health gauge. But none of that really will come into play in this boss fight. The main goal here is just to hook on to this guy as early as possible, and I can do it as soon as he starts moving. Okay, grab him by his ear. I'm gonna punch him twice to get his health right, and then do these 100 punches, and I can connect these punches together by inputting the 100 punch combo again, uh, right as it ends, and I hit A, and it'll just chain them together. It's uh, C up, C down, C up, and then A. Yeah. They do 210 pieces of damage each, and I actually didn't drop the combo here. This is a scripted part of the fight where he takes you underwater, but I'm just going to start right back up here. I definitely helps keeping track of this by just looking at the boss's health, so I try to keep it in view. Alright, I hope I did Claude's tech here. The lower Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. That might not have been low enough. I don't think that was low enough. What's it do again? It skips a It skips him just like bumping up and down <laughs> on the ground. Alright, so I want to hold map glitch here. Because Impact wants to tell us about his great movie that he's making, I think, in France. But we don't want to hear about that. We just want to get back to strolling through Japan. You actually kind of see part of the cutscene here uh, when I let go of map glitch. That's it starting. Um, it, that cutscene does come into play again. Like I'll have to skip it going towards the final dungeon because it's located like within that area. But right now we skip past it easily enough, and we're going back to Zazen to get that miracle item that was dropped in in the area by talking to Ben K or buddy Ben K. Yeah. Ben doesn't, K. Doesn't, re doesn't remember us, doesn't remember <laughs> us flying by him or anything. He still doesn't want us to cross the bridge. Like he He's hostile towards us, but kind of friendly at the same time. He'll hold a conversation just as long as it's like far away. Yeah, it's really funky. Because <laughs> normally like after you fight him, he like feels honored that you could beat him. So 
he befriends you. And you kind of learn that he's a collector of different things. So we're going to him because he seems like the most likely suspect to come across like a miracle item. Just a, just a random object and hold on to it. But he's telling us about a greater collector than even he is. And that's a Kappa located in the center pond of Zazen. Yes. It's a real Kappa. life Kappa. Yeah. His name's Kahachi. He's actually in this game and also going on three on the Super Nintendo. And he's the guy that wants the cucumber that we got earlier. It's not just an emote on Twitch. It's actually a mythical beast. Yes. So. That's what they look like, too. Yeah, they're bald. They have a bald patch on their head. So by getting that miracle item early, we actually just get taken directly to the end of the side quest. Because normally there's like an opening cutscene where we talk to him. And then we do stuff with Sasuke to get a super jump. But... None of that's necessary if we have the cucumber already. And coming up is Lottery Road. It's the road to Bizen, or through Bizen to get to the third castle. Three Macoris here. Did not get the first one, that's okay. The first one's definitely the hardest. We're just gonna out of bounds swim over to the, the door. Hopefully we get the other two though. Could I do that? Like, is it, would that be easier if I get blocked by sliding into the wall there? Yeah, the you could do that. It's not that much slower. It didn't seem like it. Alright, the angle on that was a little off, but we got the slash. It's the good stuff. So, the thing I mentioned earlier that he didn't do because he's good, um, he's going to do here. Alright, the room after this one. Yeah. It's called a Superman. And it's hilarious. Damn. Missed that one. Macquarie's off the slide, uh, off the signs. Are they harder than Macquarie's out of the door? Um, I would say so, just because you get, you get kind of get like rushed to the top of the object quicker. I don't know if that actually affects like the frame timing or not. But the one with the door is easier because Claude found out that if you hold map glitch and like you do a map glitch immediately off of the object, you have to hit the third flame frame for the slash. With that doorway though. The timing is like way easier. Hmm. And so this is the Superman. This is what happens if you do an Abisu slide and slide into a slope. You get like the sliding animation to start, but it'll keep you sustained in the air and you can float on over to this area, top of the mountain, to skip some walking. Really cool tech, uh, perfected by Rhyme and All. Really? Yeah, he's the one that found that. And he's very proud of it. <laughs> I forget how, like, when runners start in this game, it's this is one of those games that's just so fun because when you get sliding down, it really opens up the game mm -hmm. in general just for you to explore. Like, can I clip through this wall? What happens if I do this? And that's what and everybody ends up doing. And they, yeah. find, they find out how funky and weird and broken this game actually is. So this is Festival Temple Castle. This is the third castle in the game. Uh, it's normally like a super intricate castle, probably the most well-designed in the game, but we're just gonna go straight towards the end. So a slide like that, nice. Uh, a slide like that is not technically a pole slide. He kind of stops it to get stuck in the wall because if he slides too far, he won't be able to get to the door above him and that's the goal of that slide. Yeah. So not necessarily to clip through something to get to the other side of it, but to clip in the wall to get up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can control like uh, how far a BC slides go just by how long you hold the controller stick. Very easy. It's really frustrating when you slide into the wall and then come back out. Oh yeah. <laughs> Super frustrating. Or you go too far and fall out of bounds and then you have to void out. So this next room, the one after this this one here is really cool. I'll be doing an Abisu slide. Normally you're supposed to be like climbing on top of these kites that elevate you higher and higher through the room. But I'm gonna be doing something called like a flutter storage slash flutter jump. It's where if I slide off a slope and run to a ladder, it causes this like weird effect where I get an infinite height jump stored and it'll just keep going and going until I hit like a ceiling or enemy hits me. Got it right there. Nice. That was quick. And yeah, I'm just going to float over to this area's building. Or, I mean, roof. And have it pop me on top. Now, if he missed it, he would just keep on floating, and there's nothing you can do. Really yeah. Great. Well, I mean, you, 
there are cases where if you get it to go high enough, you can get popped up like on the area ceiling and fall out of bounds. But that wastes so much time because that area is super long. Like the Especially out of bounds. Especially when you're already at the top of yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, here's Tsunami. Um, been in a couple of iterations of going on actually. Uh, this boss is really usually go through three different cycles, throwing plates at you, dodging plates, and the last phase is always some red plates, but we're not gonna see any of that because you're able to slide into the center platform and deal damage directly, because usually the plates ricochet back to the heart and you have to wait, but since you're on the platform, you're able to uh, actually do direct damage, so you don't have to worry about those plates. Yeah, this is the case where Fire Rio comes in handy because it does three damage. I'm missing the boss though. The annoying thing about this boss is that its hitbox is like determined by its swooping in height. It's being poorly behaved right now. He might have fixed it. Yeah, we fixed it. This is good. So yeah, you want to be careful too not to overkill that boss because uh, it has 11 health, I believe. So that's three Rio shots and then two uh, regular slashes. If you go over that, though, the boss will just like stare at you and never die. It'll just be floating in space there. So you'd have to slide out of bounds and like do the whole fight over if that happens. And I, I kind of think that's a tough slide into that because the camera's so far away and it's hard to see, you know, actually really what's going on when you land but mm -hmm. it, usually sliding in the game is more uh, after you learn it um, feeling than visual yeah well, I did screw up the the initial slide like I had to do two slides there because I thought like Whoa. I didn't get the right slide end of the world yes the end of the world so this is where uh, Kitty Lily would actually come into play this is her introduction cutscene um, we're finding out from her that her and Danson are planning on taking a town called Kaiyushu up into the air. Uh, so Goimon and everyone wants to rush over there really quick to stop that from happening. But we skip that cutscene. <laughs> so by just like from this point, we're going to be going to the final castle instead. gotta have the laugh track too yeah i was just gonna mention that it's like it fits well with this game because it the idea is for it to be like a big stage play with the villains and all so yeah just one final warp going back to festival village again What's the area uh, called that takes you up into space? Uh, I can't remember. It doesn't have like a name. It like does have a name when you go inside of it. Like it'll appear in the corner. It's just some like ancient god shrine. Okay. It's some sort of shrine though. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Swag slash. I don't do that stuff anymore. Oh, it's beyond, <laughs> it's beyond me. Okay. It's beneath me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'm going to keep on doing it. <laughs> Does that mean no mini Ebi or no mini Koemon? I'm not doing that. Okay. I don't even know how to do it properly. <laughs> you know how to do all the speed stuff, but not all the cool stuff. Well, I, like, I have an idea on how to do it. I'm just worried that I'll screw it up. <laughs> so... Here's where the impact cutscene would normally be coming into play. I'm gonna map glitch and stand in that ways or in that door frame to just get popped into the loading zone. And skip past that cutscene again. You wanna you really wanna skip past that because um cutscene's about fifteen seconds long and it'll just eat up your pace. It won't feel like it's that big, but it will when it like does actually count. Especially since this is pretty much end game right now. Yeah, this is the end game. Musical Castle, this first part of it at least, is pretty frustrating. Like, I would put it at like Ghost Toys Part 2 in terms of how annoying the slides can be. 
but they they generally are more well behaved. It's just like a lot of slides packed into one section of gameplay. Like this castle, this part of it is about three minutes long. But if you're getting blocked by slides, it makes it much longer and you lose a bunch of time. It's an eternity. Yeah. Is there a reason that you slide into that wall versus water slide to set you up at that platform? Oh, to go up to the top platform yeah. instead of, okay. Yeah, so I just slide into that wall to reach the top of this area quicker. I'm going to switch to Goemon here to do some Rio hovers across the fans. This is called the French Canadian for the perfect line. Okay, nice. Now we got to get back. Okay, we're good. Those fans are quite annoying. They didn't program them correctly. Or if you jump like in the middle of them, you'll actually just fall straight through. It's for no reason. It's super rad. Yeah. All right, this is probably the most annoying slide in the castle, I think. Really? Yeah, I've gotten blocked hard here before. Well, you showed that slide yeah. his boss. Generally, you'll get it first try, but I feel like, again, if you don't, if you get blocked once, you get blocked forever. Yeah, that's just how it starts. It's yeah. The, uh, the, the beginning of the end, pretty much. It's a whole chain of things. So this is a cubby hole slide. We're not actually going through any wall. That's actually the first case of where a BC sliding was found was through that cubby hole. Uh, it was found by Match, the guy that did the tasks for the any percent and 100 percent. And the interesting about that slide too is when he found it, um, he actually didn't do like a full on slide. It was only like a little short, small one. One of the little baby ones. Yeah. So later on, this guy named Serpent found like the full on slide. Oh, this is that's a great camera. Yeah. He found sliding, Serpent did, and found out that we can go through any wall we want, basically, with it. Did you go over how, uh, depending on your slide, you get different momentums? Yeah, yeah. depending on, like, when you hit C up, um, will depend on how fast of a slide you get. To get slides that clip through walls, you have to get the fastest slide. I don't think that's exactly, like, frame perfect, but it's close to it. And that right there was the last slide in the game, hopefully. It's the last slide I have to worry about going through a wall. There could be one more coming up, and that's just to... Cover in case, over a gap. Yeah, in case I get landing animation. Which you've only had one, I think, this run, and it was on uh, the top in Ghost Toys. Yeah. You landed on the oh, rope. Oh yeah, well, I landed on the rope. That was really weird. So we'll see if we get it here. We did not. So yeah, we can walk across that gap just fine. And that skips having to wait for these different cycles because there's supposed to be different holes in this floor uh, for the cylinder. Or hexagonal prism, I think it's actually called. So here's the biggest case of dialogue skip coming in handy. We'll see if I get it. I did not. <laughs> I paused. <laughs> Right when the text came up instead of right before it. But this one is the biggest case because, again, it's just one of those cutscenes where the characters are just talking to each other through a text box. There's no new actor spawning or camera change. And this one saves about 20 seconds. You get treated with another song. Their idea is that they're going to make us into diehard fans by performing for us. Beautiful, Still. beautiful my stage. Yes, gorgeous my stage. Gorgeous my stage. People should uh, type that in chat probably right now. Big old wall, gorgeous my stage. It's usually proper when this comes up. It's like the deer force of <laughs> Goemon. <laughs>
This game has great music. I mean, oh yeah. As as funny as it is, it has amazing music, so it really holds true to the theme of what's going on in the game. Actually, soundtrack is beautiful. Definitely my favorite soundtrack for any video game. So it didn't quite work. We're not exactly impressed. We're more confused, except for Abusumaru, who is like, "Hey, I love that actually. They're not so bad after all." But uh, going on shakes them back into reality, and when we realize that they're gonna blow up uh, the castle. And actually, Kaiyushu too. That little hedge maze area, I believe, is supposed to be the Kaiyushu town. So now we're going to summon Impact again to take care of Danton and Lily once and for all. Isn't there only voice acting in the Japanese version? Uh, for the ending and the opening cutscene, yeah. Yeah. The songs are in the game, though. Yeah. That's the great thing about this game is just the voice work is also just so well done, especially for the time period that it came out and being on the N64. <laughs> yeah. yeah, high quality voice clips for sure. And like they, they weren't stingy. Like I mentioned earlier with getting like good voice work, not only is the impact song sung by that guy that did like all the robot themes, um, the opening song is sung by a Japanese guy that did the Dragon Ball Z opening themes in Japan. Like, he did a lot of songs for Dragon Ball, so you'd recognize his voice if you're a fan of that series. And also, Danson and Lily. Um, I found out, I think this is accurate, that Danson, the guy that does his voice, is actually someone that does, like, different dubbing for movies, and he did singing for the Japanese dub of Pocahontas. And then the voice actress for Lily like later on went and did songs for different Final Fantasy games. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's actually like high quality for sure. Not just Joe off the street. Yeah. All right, so this is Dancing in Italy's big ship, the Peach, shaped in the image of a peach. I called Balbera. I don't see it. <laughs> So your main goal in this boss fight is to shoot at its core. Normally this red thing right there is blocking your path, but if you shoot just a little bit above or below it, you can hit the sweet spot. This boss fight is actually supposed to be kind of intricate where we go around fighting different pieces of it. But if we manage to kill these peach ships that are flying around, I missed one. Okay, I got them all. It'll open up the core again. And that's scripted that way, to where they always want to have the cycles where you're going around end on the peach ships attacking you. So if you manage to kill them all right away, it'll just start up again with it opening the core up. And I just laser inside of it when it opens up again for the second round of peaches. And the laser does 400 damage, and then from there, just continue firing shots. How much does the chain pipe do? Oh, chain pipe's just for style. Oh, it's really? Some swag. Just swag? Yeah. But I think it, technically it does like 10 damage or something. So here's Daytoila. Uh, he's very similar to the first impact boss fight that we had, Tai Samba. There's one case of like luck RNG here, and that's where he flies at the beginning. There's four different locations that he can fly into. Um, there's some that are closer than others. That one was one of the further ones. So that's the nice thing though about this game is that you don't really have to worry about different luck factors. Like, everything is pretty set. Even in that case where RNG actually did come into play, it only amounted to about three or four seconds. And from here, I'm just beating him up. Oh, crap. I missed one infinite punch. So if you miss that punch, he goes into this meteor shower phase. And from there, I'll just laser him. And then try to quickly hook him in again for a 
some more damage to finish him off. It's really annoying though if you drop the combo because he has like the shield that'll block your first initial punch to like keep him within the range of your attack. And we're gonna be having time come up. So. Yeah, in about a minute during this cutscene. This game's timing is a little odd. Japanese have it set up strange where it's like this white frame that decides when time is done. But basically here, Goemon's talking with Danson and Lily. And he's saying that he still has the instant stage beam so he can still take out Japan. He calls him Fernandez, which sets Goemon off because he doesn't like being called Fernandez. And they shoot one final impact laser at him and it shoots him off into space where they can become the true stars that they always dreamed of. Just space dust. Alright, time. That's Mystical Ninja starting going on. Yep, that's, this is the game. Great speed run. Great just game in general just to play casually. The series deserves more love because it certainly did not get a fair shot when it came out in America. Like, they only released, I think, four of these games in America. And there's just a whole big series. Your final time is 115.50. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. It's a solid time. Yeah, it is. Great marathon time. This PB is 114.03? Uh, yeah, yeah. 114.03. So now we're just returning to Earth. Um, talking about what happened. And they realize that they kind of forgot about Kaiyushu, so they're trying to figure out what they need to do to fix that problem. But off in the distance, they notice that it's actually just returning to Earth perfectly in place where it needs to be. Because it just works out that way. Yeah. They just got really lucky. So now the idea is that they're going to go rush over there and see the friends, the wise old man and Omitsu. It's kind of Goemon's girlfriend. We didn't get to see her at any point in the game, though. But they're over there, and they want to go and see him. And there's Suke, who we didn't use or even get at all. But he's part of the team. Yeah, he's basically like DLC. <laughs> and then the fan club, right? Yeah, so this is like the fanfare. Goemon and everyone, well not everyone, Goemon and Abisumaru think that they're finally going to be congratulated for saving Japan for once. And they see these girls rushing over towards them. And they're really excited, they want to get all these kisses and hugs and everything. Sasuke is kind of unfazed because he's a robot, indifferent. But Yai's a little bit more suspicious of what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, see, this usually in the in the English version, there's no voice acting. Yeah, here. it's just silence with some subtitles. <laughs> so yeah, we find out they're actually really angry with us for taking down Dancing in the Lee. These women actually were just in love with the idea of them turning Japan to this great stage, so now they're going to beat us up, tell us what's what for what we've done. And Abisumaru ends it off with saying we're idiots. And, <laughs> and that's that's the game. This is the credits now. <laughs> great story. Yeah. Top notch. Thanks for having it. It's finally good to show yeah, off the marathon. This is, this is well-deserving of a marathon setting. It's a great speedrun. Lots of tech. 
cool stuff to talk about. There's always something to say about what's going on. Once again, the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then next weekend is your marathon, right? Uh, next weekend, Goemonathon. Uh, it's just we appreciate every Goemon game. Like he said, there's only been a few that have come out on uh, home consoles, Super Nintendo and N64, but we're going full bore, a lot of Goemon. And it's just no incentives, no nothing. It's just a, just a good time. It's yeah. Just a good time. It's because we just love the series. Yeah. So. But yeah. Check that out next weekend. All right. Thank you. So next up we have Star Fox 64 by Lyra R. And we actually still have an incentive that hasn't been met yet. It's for Kill Slippy, so get that in if you really want to see Slippy die. Also we have a donation from CMM1215. Sorry for the early donation, but good luck, Lyat. Wish you, I could be here to watch your run, but you will <laughs> it, you'll do great at it. Can't wait to hear about it. And then we also have a $21 donation, $21 donation from Teddy, which says Team Brown won't be beat. And that is for the Kirby Color Air Ride donation incentive. Alrighty, and while we're setting up for this next run, I'm just going to play a quick Twitch ad, so just relax and enjoy the rest of the stream. <laughs> 